Yeah, good morning. Thank you uh, very much to all participants connected to this uh, training session. And thank you to our host institution, CITO, the Central Information and Technology Office. My name is Mike Mora with the Department for Effective Public Management of the Organization of American States. Welcome to the fifth dedicated training in open data of the project promoting an open ecosystem in Belize, implemented by the Trust for the Americas and the Department for Effective Public Management of the OAS, with the support of the Embassy of the United States of America in Belize. In this session, we will learn about the specific experiences of implementation and use of open data through the eyes of different experiences that have been successfully implemented. Our goal with this session is to embrace, specialize, and develop skills in a dedicated group of officers to innovate, transcend, and improve in public service delivery through open government and that can become agents for change in doing so. I want to thank you uh, all, uh, all attendees for, for your commitment throughout this session. This week we begin our final week uh, with these sessions. And in the two sessions, we're going we're gonna to be learning about using open data. This specific part, the light of the cases, and then on Thursday, on the next session, at the light of a specific, or we're going to explore in specific technical aspects of how this happened. So uh, hopefully today's cases will illustrate us, will uh, motivate us to learn about how to do it technically, and that part it's, it's going to be deal with on, on, on Thursday. Um, Please uh, let, our, let our local coordinator, uh, our local project coordinator, Mr. Henry Wake, who's connected on, in, in this session right now, and, and you can share with him in the chat about engaging with this open government project. Um, we can all, we, we will also hear from uh, Henry Wake at the end of the presentations as he will moderate the questions and answers session. Thank you, uh, Henry. Uh, since I mentioned the, the Q&A session, uh, I just want to say uh, or encourage you to please prepare your questions and share them through the presentation, throughout the presentations, using the chat tool of this platform. Uh, don't wait until the end. If you have a question, uh, if there is something that you want to know um, or would you like the speakers to talk more about, uh, let us know in the chat. And so we collect those questions and, and we have them ready for the speakers once the presentations are done. Uh, without further ado, um, I would like to present the speakers of the day. Uh, they are Mr. Daniel Carranza and Dr. Maurice uh, McNaughton. Daniel uh, will show us with two cases in Uruguay on health and city management, the practical uh, phase of uh, open data, whereas uh, Maurice will bring us the Caribbean perspective on open data, touching in, this, in the use of open data in a specific sector. So thank you both. I will present them now uh, so that we can just move along with their presentations once they're ready. Daniel Carranza is the co-founder of Data Uruguay, Data UI, a civil society organization that creates tools and advocates for open data and open government locally and regionally through initiatives such as Abre la Tap, um, a regional conference on open data uh, for civil society. He is a consultant in digital tools and media for multilaterals governments, civil society, and businesses. He specializes in open government and e-government. And last but not least, Daniel is an open government fellow of the Organization of American States. It's a pleasure to have you here, Daniel. On the other hand, Dr. Maurice Hammond-Nothan is the director of the Center of Excellence of IT-Enabled Innovation at the Mona School of Business and Management with the University of the West Indies and is currently doing active research in the areas of open data and big data, mobile financial services, and open source platforms. He is founding member of the Caribbean Open Institute, a regional coalition of Caribbean organizations that engages and works with regional governments, researchers, journalists, technologists, NGOs, and academics to raise awareness, strengthen capacity, and foster collaboration towards the adoption of open government approaches. Uh, Dr. McNaughton holds a PhD in Decision Science at Georgia State University and has over 20 years of senior man management and leadership experience in the planning and direction of enterprise learning information technology and organizations. Thank you very much also, Maurice, uh, for having me here. 
Okay, uh, I just want to move on uh, to the presentation um, uh, immediately, and I will then uh, ask actually um, Daniel if you could start with your presentation, and then we move to um, to Maurice. Um, again, sure thing. for all participants, leave your presentations. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, leave your questions uh, for the presenters in the, using the chat room. And I will load your presentation, Danielle, and I will ask Maurice then to just uh, quit your camera, as I will do as well, uh, so we can have only Danielle uh, doing the video uh, for bandwidth um, constraints and, and so on. So give me just a second, Danielle, and I'll load your presentation here. Okay, here we go, Daniel. It's all yours. Oh, okay, there it is. Okay, uh, so thank you for having me here. It's a, a real pleasure, and uh, I hope this is useful. And please, as Mike said, um, leave your questions on the chat. And if you have other questions uh, at a later point, please do get them to me either through email, which is at the end of the presentation, or forward them through mic. I'll be glad to help if I can. Uh, so I'm part of Data Uruguay, which is a, a civil society organization that works basically on three main pillars. We build tools so we can help people improve their lives in some sort of way, usually through open data. Um, we build community around open data and open government and those kind of, of topics. Uh, so we can build those tools and we can also use them to promote change in some sort. And we also have our activism side where we work with government and with other organizations in well promoting people to actually publish data and use data and um, uh, get themselves on board with these uh, issues of transparency, of participation, of open government, of collaboration, etc., etc. Um, so what, what will we talk about uh, today? The idea is to go through two of our main projects and use them as sort of examples um, to, to understand the different issues that we face or what we try to solve with this, in which ones we have succeeded and which ones we, we haven't and to get some um, key lessons from all that at the very end that we learned through this actually six years that we've been working um, within our organization. Um, I think I, I forgot to say that we are based in Uruguay, but we also work with um, other partner organizations around Latin America and the world, actually, um, where we replicate these projects or work in new projects with them. So, let's start with por mi barrio, which means for my borough or for my neighborhood, if you want, uh, in a literal translation. And it's um, the sort of tool that allows you to um, send reports or claims on things that are broken in your city or whatever, like a street light, a pothole, or, or stuff like that. Um, but the first question... Uh, before thinking about a project like this is a big why. Um, there's a ton of similar projects around the world. <laughs> um, some of them are private, some of them are public, some of them are partnerships within civil society or businesses with governments, stuff like that. There's really a lot to choose from when you are going to develop one of these sort of projects. Uh, and we believe that the main thing that we had to take into account uh, before embarking into our version of those sort of projects was to understand what we wanted to do and in what way um, these claims online would eventually end up in solutions for people. Basically, what we wanted to avoid, which is something that happens a lot in these sort of projects, is only having a map online with a lot of little beautiful pins with a lot of problems, but not that po those problems actually getting uh, to the people who can solve them 
so you end up with a map full of complaints, but nothing done with those complaints. For that reason is that we not only chose uh, the most standard platform that we could find, which was Fix My Street, which is open software, free software from my society, an organization in the UK, but we also chose to work uh, through open services, which you could understand as some sort of next step or further uh, furthering the concept of open data, where we are not only consuming data that the government has published, but we are interacting with government through services or APIs, if you want the, the technical term. Um, in, in our case, through sending those claims directly to government systems and getting from them the feedback to us. So summing up this, this question, basically, why are we doing this? Because we want these problems not to get um, more like, not, not to visualize those problems, but to actually channel them to the proper people who can solve them, right? Uh, sorry, there. This is a screen cap of the platform, uh, which is the typical thing with this sort of software, nothing new here. Uh, you got the list of claims, you got the claims on the map, you can click on each one of them, see when it was done, um, see who did it, uh, or they can also be done anonymously, uh, the category, and something that is actually an advantage on other um, platforms of this sort is that you can also see um, all the progress the report has made within government systems. And let me just uh, explain that a little bit more. As I said, we were using open services uh, with the local government in Montevideo, the Intendencia de Montevideo. And that means that every claim that is um, reported through our platform, first of all, goes right into the system that the local government uses to manage all their claims. It doesn't matter if you get them through the web, through the telephone, personally. And we uh, keep a connection to that system. So every claim that we send to them is then updated with all the information they have on it. Right now, we are on the point where, for instance, if you report a pothole and the area that repairs those potholes has, um, has a crew scheduled to go and fix it next week, you can see on your claim that scheduling for next week, even before they fix it. Uh, that level of integration was the real uh, novelty, if you want, uh, or improvement in this sort of systems. And that has been the, the, the thing that made Por Mi Barrio a pretty popular app uh, around the civic tech space. Um, beyond that, the platform is obviously um, multi-platform, basically. You can use it online, you can use it on a tablet and a cell phone. We also have native apps for both Android and, and iOS, and that includes uh, offline working with the um, offline reporting, sorry, because um, as I said, we work not only in Uruguay, but, but partnering with other organizations uh, outside of the country. And one of those partnerships um, was with uh, Accesa, which is an organization based in Costa Rica. Uh, they were working with two local governments in very small um, municipal localities, like uh, they call them cantones in Costa Rica. And actually, connectivity was an issue which was not part of what we had to face in Uruguay. So we added this functionality to allow people to get a report through the cell phone. And whenever you get a connection, that report is actually sent to the local government. Um, sorry, there. Then we got the whole uh, stats module. And that, that is the best excuse to say that the platform itself, it's obviously very important and very useful as a, a way for citizens to report problems to the local government. But we believe, and we actually learned this uh, after a few years using it, that 
Just as important is the fact that it has uh, nudged or pushed the, the local government to improve some of its uh, practices and ways that they handle information internally. So this sort of stats is what you see when you go to the app. Well, actually go to the stats module within the app. You can see the amount of users currently registered and the amount of claims done in the last year, month or whatever. Uh, you can see all the categories, you can see how they vary through time and stuff like that. You can actually delve much deeper into the information. And of course, the information is also available as open data for download. Um, but th this sort of thing is actually what meant that the local government not only embraced this practice through Pomibarrio, or like through our app, but they also end up embracing them in a more general sense. When we started this project in 2014, um, the local government already had a way to report claims online. They called it the citizen's um, mailbox, something like that, Busan Ciudadano. Right, so you could uh, upload, let's say, your claim. You would get a, a number associated, associated to your claim, and you could go online and check if there was any advance. But the logic was, after you made your claim, it was your responsibility to go back online and check with the number <coughs> if anything was advanced or not, and if anything was done. For me, Barrio changed that, lo that logic in, in several ways. First of all, uh, well, the, the usability of the tool improved quite a bit. Uh, it was based on a map, for instance, like with pretty pictures and colors and stuff like that. Um, but most importantly, after you make your claim, you will receive emails with every update that we can get on what, whatever you claim for. And so that was the first thing that the local government actually ended up adopting. They started notifying all users through every channel. I mean, for instance, you could make a, um, a claim personally, but as long as you gave your email, you would still receive emails with notifications from all advances. Thanks to uh, adopting that sort of practice from what we have done here with Pomi Barrio. Um, similarly, you wouldn't have access before to the information on the rest of the claims. You would know everything that happened with what you claimed, but you wouldn't know what everyone else was claiming or stuff like that. Um, Although they, they, they took a few years to, to adopt this practice, right now they just launched actually, I think it's a few days ago, a new app where you can do something very similar than Por Mi Barrio. You can see a map with all claims, even the ones that are solved from three months ago. Um, so there's a new level of transparency on what the local government has done and how fast they do it and stuff like that. And as well, uh, they have published open data on over 30,000 claims or something like that. that I think it's the last 30,000, uh, which amounts to a couple of months. Um, and they, they adopted this as a standard practice, while before that you had absolutely no information. So I think this is part of the most interesting of uh, Pomi Barrio's impact. It's not only the app itself, but how the app, by showing that making claims easier to do online uh, didn't bring like a waterfall of claims that was unbearable, that showing that by being transparent and showing uh, the state of every claim, uh, you could actually show that you were doing a good work and not actually be afraid of what people would think that you were doing, it was wrong, whatever. And those practices have been positively influenced by, by the existence of this tool. Some of the um, important uh, stuff on how we design this and how this works is, first of all, that it's a multi-stakeholder uh, project, if you want. Uh, we, of course, are, are involved as civil society. We also give some sort of guarantee that this is all true, that the information is, is real, that the claims are actually getting to where they have to go. Of course, the government is, is involved because they are the ones who actually solve the problems that people post on the platform. 
Um, another very important thing is that we added from the very beginning of the project the like the support of the neighborhood's uh, ombudsman or the city's ombudsman. Um, that means that, for instance, we have a integrated within our system that if you have a claim that it's not solved uh, in a way that you are satisfied with, you can take that claim and its whole history and send it to the ombudsman so they can also get involved and do something about it. This, of course, has also a very important role of donors that actually allow this platform to happen. This was made with, a, with money from Avina and Omidia. And, of course, citizens, which are the ones who actually make the, the, the reports and the claims. Um, this is also part of a bigger um, ecosystem, if you want, uh, that involves people within and outside the country. Uh, some of the, the, the stakeholders are the same ones that we already mentioned, like the local government, the ombudsman, which is the little logo with a boy and a girl, um, uh, Fix My Street, which is the software that we are originally based on, which was developed, as I said, uh, in the UK. Um, also, the open data platform of the, of the national government, where both the local government and us publish all our open data from the claims. And there's also a ton of on offline work um, since we launched like uh, capacity building on community intermediaries and stuff like that, people that are actually um, the most interested in channeling demands through the app. And there's also a lot of work through open data and open services by like interacting with these different actors, in particular with the local government of Montevideo, uh, of course. And as well as I started explaining with the Costa Rica case, we have also replicated this project. We've successfully replicated in a few places, the most notably in, in Costa Rica, um, in partnership with Accessa and with support of EVOS. Um, this has been done in, the, in two uh, cantones, uh, Osa and Palmares. And it's also being done in a few other cities with different levels of success, but uh, we think it's it's a good thing that the, the tool has shown that it has the flexibility to be taken elsewhere. Okay, how are we with time? I think you are okay, right? Yeah. So the other tool that I wanted to talk about is called uh, atuservicio.ui, which translates to something like at your service. It's a completely different subject matter. In this case, we're working with health. And once again, which is what's the reason to create a tool that shows data on, in our case, uh, public, uh, sorry, um, health service providers? Well, the fact is that in, in Uruguay we have this situation where you can only choose your health service provider once a year during uh, a short amount of time, the, the, month, the month of February, right? So the Ministry of Health had, had identified this problem or People were choosing health service providers without all the proper information. They were mainly choosing based on market information. Um, and they tried to solve that through the publication of data. But the way they did it is they published just this huge Excel file, which was really very hard to understand. And they had very limited success with that because at the most they got 500 downloads, something like that, of that huge uh, file. So we started working on that same problem with the, the same information that they published. We had one first attempt at trying to show that information in a more, in a more entertaining or, or understandable way. And we ended up partnering with them to work, um, which was actually very interesting. And I know this is about open data, but uh, it ties beautifully into the whole open government thing. Because the fact is that the contact between uh, our organization and the Ministry of Health came about in one of the meetings for the co-creation of the third national action plan on open government. So we had the involvement of uh, the e-government agency as well, who is the one that coordinates that. And we also had involvement of international donors, in this case, ILDA and Avina. So 
What we ended up with, like the first version of our project, is what you're seeing right now, which is basically a platform where you have this uh, broad visualizations of different um, data points for the health service providers. Here, are, to translate a few, these are waiting times, user rights, um, prices, um, uh, like goals that they are set for, uh, amount of, um, of users, and human resources. This is just the home page. You can later go to an in-depth comparison where you have over 300 individual data points that you can compare. You can really delve deep. And that platform quickly evolved uh, into a much nicer one, as you can see, um, in, in a matter of a year. Um, OK. Um, so. This was, and most importantly, co-created with the Ministry of Health. And that's actually the main thing about this project and the, the fact that made it very successful and also recognized internationally is that this was not about just consuming open data. And I know I, you probably heard this a lot. And it's fine, the idea of just publishing open data and waiting or hoping for other people to use it. But we truly believe that the what the, the key feature that you can add to your open data program is not only publishing, but working with others to find ways to use that open data and produce significant uh, impact. And in this case, this meant combining uh, what we knew best with what the Ministry of Health knew best. And I think that's in our, yeah, on our next slide. So. The project itself has a clear objective, which is democratizing access to information on health providers. Right? As I was saying, we had this problem where people were choosing and they didn't really have enough information to take that, that decision properly. And this platform not only made that information available, but they, it made it available in a way that's much easier to understand, to process, and to compare information from different health providers. As I was saying, co-creation is absolutely the key issue in this project. Um, when we did this first experiment I was telling you about, where we took the data the ministry was publishing and did something by, our, by ourselves, we made many mistakes. We weren't really understanding the data completely. Uh, we tried, for instance, to make a ranking of health providers, and we learned that that was a really, really, really bad idea. Because the way you can rank something is never perfectly adjusted to what users need. Um, so we were taking some kind of responsibility saying this one is better than this one, when that wasn't necessarily true. Uh, all these were, were, were things that we learned afterwards by working with people who actually knew <laughs> about the content of the data, not only of, of how showing it in a nice way, um, and we truly have adopted that for every single project that we work on right now. Uh, we believe you have to combine expertises. This was also developed as free open software and with open data. Um, actually, we asked the ministry to publish the data they already published properly as open data so we could consume that data uh, instead of you know getting the data and then publishing it as as open data. And it ended up being, not to our knowledge at that point, a pretty pioneering experience in, in that sense. Um, on the impact side, what has this, this project uh, accomplished? Well, we, we were able to go from these 500 downloads of, of the raw data that I was telling you about to over 65,000 sessions. That was in 2016. If you take the cumulative sessions from the three or four years we've been doing this, that's much, much larger. Um, and one of the most interesting things from this, as soon as we launched, is that the quality of the data improved very rapidly. Those, those uh, data sets were published for four years, approximately, as, as I said. And although they were available and visible to people, 
not many people really saw them, so no one really cared about the, the quality of those data sets. As soon as we went live, like the first day, we started receiving calls from all health providers, getting corrections from the data they themselves, they themselves sent, sorry. Uh, also finding mistakes in the ministry's own data sets and also some corrections that had to do with, with us messing up data in, the, in processing it. And so the quality of the data improved within the first week in a very clear way. Then we had user verification of data. That's also very important. For instance, you, you saw that one of the categories that we had was waiting times. Thanks to this data being public and very visible, we found out that a couple of health providers were actually using a little trick to try to fake their waiting times to seem lower. Uh, but thanks to users saying, like, that's not true, that's not true, that's not true, uh, we were, the, the ministry actually was able to detect that. Um, we, were also, um, uh, we were also capable of uh, making available uh, new data sets. Every, every year, actually, we had at least two data sets with new information for users to to see and compare. We were able to also foster a very interesting public discussion on health providers based on data for the first time, that the, the data from the app, actually screen caps from the app even, have been used by politicians in government, politicians in the opposition, and so the uni health unions also. That sort of discussion using um, the app's data was also very, very interesting. We were able to capture and channel a lot of claims related to health providers uh, through the public channels, thanks to uh, us working with the Ministry of Health. This is also a good example of why you should try to co-create tools, even though you can also produce them independently with open data. We could have used that data and create a very similar tool, but people would start writing to us saying that, OK, you know, that, that thing you have there is not true or I had this problem with a health provider, and the only thing that we could have done was saying, okay, you should talk to these guys, uh, but nothing else. In our case, after seeing them, uh, after the first year, we received those kinds of, of claims and, and complaints. We ended up creating a way to channel all those through formal channels within the Ministry of Health. And finally, and almost surprisingly for us, we also had a, a positive impact on prices. Uh, we really didn't expect this, but since all those prices were published right there, uh, a lot of health providers started seeing that they they were in a, they were losing a competitive advantage uh, because it was very evident that some of their prices were clearly higher than the rest. So they started lowering those prices that were clearly different from others, and so this app ended up impacting positively in a general uh, decrease. In, in prices, which for us was truly amazing. So to end this presentation, I think that in time and everything, what have we learned from this kind of, of projects? First of all, seek the right partners. And I, I must insist on this, do, ser do search for partners, even though you can do a lot of this alone or you can wait for others to do it for you in a sense. Um, I think that co-creation and working together really always gets best the best results, um, and I thoroughly recommend that. Find where you can be complementary with them. For instance, in, in our case, we are a civil society organization, and we have a very clear um, notion that our our um, like our part. Is, has to do with uh, user experience, has to do with design, has to do, of course, with the technical side, but that's not nearly as hard as people think, and has to do with getting people together, understanding, empathizing, and creating tools that give answers to several problems, while our partners usually have the expertise on the vertical of the subjects that we work on, in this case, uh, health, in Por Mi Barrio, public services, and stuff like that. Um, assume you'll need to adapt, change, and iterate. Uh, all these tools 
will change on time. You will learn. You will discover what you've done wrong, what you've done right. And that ties up to the next uh, item. The project really starts when you finish the development and launch. We, we usually have this, we like humans in general, <laughs> have this tendency to think that the work is done when you launch an app, and that's absolutely not true. That's actually the very beginning of the real work. And you will start getting all this feedback, you will start discovering all that you have to change. So design your projects in a way that the launch of the app or whatever is not the end of the way, but in worst case scenario, just the, the middle point, because you will need to change stuff. And finally, promotion and communication are as important as the app. Um, this is also a very hard earned lesson, especially when you work uh, through civil society and you're using funding from donations and uh, international foundations and stuff like that. It's very hard to take a, a budget to a founder and say, I will spend half your budget on advertising. Most, actually most donors won't accept that. However, a project that is great, but nobody knows about, it's as useless as no project at all. Uh, so it's really very important, especially when you're working from government and you have the resources and capability to use the machinery of communication that governments usually have, to really commit to communicating these sort of projects properly once they're done. There, there is a ton of beautiful projects that weren't really used um, just because they were not properly communicated, not because they had technical failures or they were bad, a bad idea in any sense. And yeah, that's that's the end of it of my empire. That's the end of it from my part. I hope that was sort of useful and I would be glad to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, for this insightful presentation. I, uh, you left me with, with a bunch of questions that I will hold to the, uh, to the end uh, once uh, Maurice is done. Um, and, but thank you. Thank you very much to specific cases, uh, health in, 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 in city development, um, community engagement, and, uh, very important. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, for those. So, um, there's some questions already on the platform. Um, you can take a look uh, while Maurice is presenting. Uh, although, as I said, um, Henry uh, Way will be um, moderating the Q&A session. So thank you very much. At this point, I'm going to ask you to turn your camera off. And I'm going to ask Maurice to turn his um, camera on um, while I upload his uh, presentation. And uh, thank you, Maurice, for... Um, for joining us uh, in this uh, in this session, uh, all the way from Jamaica, and Maurice will be bringing the uh, Korean perspective to this um, round of sessions that we had. Uh, a lot of insight. Um, what's, what's what? What are other countries in the Caribbean doing in open data, uh, and what have been some of the cases that can be showcased um, in, in in a session like this? So I want to. Thank Maurice for uh, joining us. I want to thank um, through him and uh, University of the West Indies, of, of course, uh, the Center of Excellence of IT Enabled Innovation at the Mona School of Business and Management. Um, if you could also tell us uh, during your presentation how has been the um, the role, or what is the, you know, what has been the role of, of, of this school of business and management in promoting open data in the Caribbean? That will be great. Um, thank you. Uh, so, Maurice, don't forget to turn your camera on. Um, you have to do a double click uh, and start sending. There we go. It is activated, and your presentation is, is coming up anytime there. So, from this point on, it's all yours, um, Maurice. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, good morning again, 
everyone. Let me just uh, set my timer. All right, very good. So it's uh, it's a pleasure to be able to join you this morning and to share some perspective on what we've been doing with open data in the Caribbean and a little bit about the Caribbean Open Institute as a regional uh, organization. And uh, uh, Diana, that was a very interesting presentation, in fact, and I'm, I'm happy that, uh, that you went first because in many respects, Latin America has been a leader uh, globally in, in open data and uh, we collaborate quite closely with our big brothers, if you will, INDA, which is also based in Uruguay. Um, so that was a very interesting perspective that you provided on those two open data enabled applications. And I'll probably reference that a little bit as I speak about the Caribbean opportunities. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about the Caribbean Open Institute. Uh, similar to what Daniel said here, really based on three pillars, but, but first the pillars are again, advocacy, which uh, this session is is uh, part of that advocacy. So we engage a lot with uh, regional governments and government agencies around open data and the opportunities that it presents. Evidence, uh, so our, our genesis is to a large extent based in the university. We have partners at the University of West Indies in, in Trinidad as well. And so we do a lot of work on research to understand the nuances of the Caribbean and the opportunities that open data represents. And then capacity building. So again, trying to build up the open data ecosystem through training, which ranges from just basic data literacy for citizens all the way up to looking at things like big data analytics within the private enterprise. Uh, so those are three pillars that uh, we, we sort of build our program and our initiatives around. And I, I think by now everyone knows what open data is and in this particular conversation we're talking about open government data. Although it's important to point out that increasingly there are lots of open data opportunities emerging from other data providers such as the private sector. Um, um, but a lot of our focus has been around working with uh, governments in the region on the proactive release of government data and release in a way that makes it readily usable um, so that you know publishing data in PDF documents is not does not quite qualify as open data. Of course it has to be in a form that makes it reusable to build um, the kinds of um, value adding applications that, that Daniel mentioned for instance. Uh, I just mentioned briefly that the Caribbean Open Institute is part of a larger network, uh, the Open Data for Development Network, which is a, a global network. Um, and we are one of uh, maybe five regional hubs. I mentioned ILDA, which is a Latin American uh, regional hub. We are the Caribbean hub. Uh, and this is important because it puts us as part of a larger network that's focused on open data for development. And primarily focus on the opportunities and the issues within the global south. So very often a lot of the trade literature that you read talks about the open data experiences in North America and in the UK and in Europe and those are quite interesting but uh, it's very important that we look at it from the perspective of what it means for developing economies like ours. So being part of this network is uh, quite valuable and it puts us in a position to benefit from and we love these global initiatives um, such as the Open Data Research Network, the Open Data Barometer, which is becoming kind of the, the reference index for how countries are doing in relation to their open data initiatives, um, and, and a number of other things. The School of Data, which uh, focuses on capacity building and data literacy. Um, so being a part of this global network puts us in a position to um, not just reinvent the wheel, but also to benefit from a lot of um, global activities that are focused on open data for development. Having said that, it's quite important uh, that, that for the, the, the Caribbean, we, we understand the nuances of open data from a, a Caribbean perspective. Uh, so that, you know, in the Caribbean, there are some, let's say there are kind of two idiosyncrasies that we have to deal with. There are some cultural issues. I mean, the slide is, uh, my slide is not showing everything, but I, 
uh, I'll speak to it. So there, there are some cultural issues. Um, uh, certainly we've found that many of our government agencies are not necessarily inclined uh, to share data. And Sorry about that. Um, and, and that seems to be a cultural disposition which we, we, we have to get over. And of course, there's also the issue of our institutional constraints. Uh, the fact that many of our uh, economies, many of our government agencies are relatively small, relatively resource constrained, and so we can't take the kinds of approaches to open data that larger development econ developed economies have, have taken. So the point is that within this setting, it is very important that our approach to open data focuses on how to maximize the returns from the investment of scarce resources. Um, in a lot of the advocacy conversations we've had with governments, it's always an issue that, well, do I allocate resources? Do I spend money on open data? Or do I build classrooms in a new school? So it, it competes with many other uh, demands for the use of uh, public resources and so it's very important that we look at open data from the perspective of how it creates value, how it solves problems. And so again the two examples that Daniel offered are quite important uh, like, uh, illustrations of looking at open data as a economic driver or you know a driver of improved efficiencies rather than sort of the traditional preoccupation with just transparency. Um, so that, that has been our focus, uh, looking at open data within the Caribbean's cultural and institutional context and looking at uh, how does this create um, value uh, without assuming that it does, but finding tangible evidence through research. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the action research initiatives that we've done to demonstrate the possibilities. Um, so, you know, the global conversation around open data speaks to the economic value, and we see numbers ranging from three trillion to uh, the McKinsey estimates, um, and there are many other estimates. And the bottom line is that open data is perceived to have a lot of economic value, but what does that mean for the Caribbean? Uh, so we found it necessary, and we work very closely with uh, uh, Capri, which is a policy research institute here at the University of the West Indies, to look at the opportunities for open data and, in fact, the economic value opportunities within sectors like tourism and agriculture uh, and education, uh, because uh, these are some of the biggest opportunity spaces for the Caribbean. Um, so, for instance, when we did this study on Jamaica, and I'm happy to share that um, report, uh, we found that you know, effective approaches to open data could contribute up to one and a half percent GDP. Um, no, that's uh, that, that, that would be quite impactful, um, given some of the growth challenges we've had here in Jamaica, and I think within the larger Caribbean. So the point is, the bottom line is that open data can create economic value. Um, and some of the work we did in that study is look at specific sectors. So if you look at tourism, for instance. Um, using open data to enhance the linkages between tourism and other sectors such as agriculture, manufacturing, um, and craft. Um, there's some big opportunities there. In, in Jamaica, for instance, um, the agricultural inputs to our tourism sector, domestic agriculture contributes probably less than 40% of the food inputs to the tourism sector. Um, and the rest are imports, right? Now, part of the challenge there is uh, with these linkages. And so you have you know, agricultural produce going to waste in the field because the opportunities to aggregate and scale those up uh, to provide uh, inputs to the tourism sector um, are, are not managed effectively. So those are some of the kinds of challenges that open data can help to resolve. Um, some of the other opportunities, and I won't go through all of these um, in relation to tourism, but certainly things like improving the quality of service delivery in, in support services such as transportation, entertainment, merchandising. So that when a tourist gets off the cruise ship, as they often do here in Jamaica or in Belize for that matter, uh, they have a small window of opportunity, two, three, four hours. How so do you maximize that? 
Um, think about a mobile app, for instance, that allows them to pick and choose what they want to do, um, to schedule a driver that picks them up, takes them to these places, and maximizes the time that they spend in port and get them back to ship on time. So, again, those are some of the kinds of application opportunities that we see in uh, tourism that can create a lot of value from open data. Similarly, we did the same kind of studies in agriculture. And uh, again, you know, the big opportunities in agriculture. I mean, from our own studies of the Jamaican economy, um, uh, effective use of open data can help to address issues such as Pridia Lasne, which I know is a, is a uh, perennial Caribbean problem. Um, by increasing the opportunity for forensics um, by the police force. And in fact, we're doing some work now with the Minister of Agriculture and uh, an area of the police force that deals with pretty last to make this more information driven. Um, all opportunities for open data in agriculture include um, making the extension officers that work with the Minister of Agriculture more efficient when they go out in the field to work with farmers. And I'll show you an illustration of that kind of application. So again, for us and, and for the Caribbean, it's important that we look at these open data opportunities within the context of, of sectors that are important to us. And for instance, the work in tourism is not something that shows up a lot in the global open data dialogue. But you know, for Jamaica, for Belize, for many of the countries in the Caribbean, uh, tourism contributes upwards of 50% GDP in some cases, and so it's obvious an important sector that we would look to prioritize. Um, so just to give an example, this is an example of some of the work that we did in, in agriculture. So the Minister of Agriculture, um, rather, that provides extension offices, officers and services would typically go out and gather data and they have a record of every farmer across the country. But that data is generally just statistical data. Um, what we did was take some of that data from them. Uh, they published it as open data. And we were able to visualize that as a map so that you can visually see a map of Jamaica and all the farms color coded by what farmers plant predominantly, the size of the farms. And this was a really interesting project because previous to this, they did not have uh, geolocation data for all of the farms, and we still don't. Um, but what we're able to do was take the information that they had, which is the parish, the extension area, and the district, and use uh, some students up here at the university to do a quite interesting uh, trick of uh, approximating the geolocation of each of these farms based on the extension and district area. So it's an approximation but it gives you the opportunity to visualize that, and then you can improve this geolocation data over time. And so it makes an important point that data does not have to be perfect to be published. Uh, we get from many of the government agencies that we interact with a lot of times, well, the data is not clean. Um, that's not the point. I think one of the important uh, points Daniel made is that by the Ministry of Health publishing data that they had, as soon as it becomes visible, it gets cleaned up very quickly. Um, I guess it's an old law which says that under many eyes our books are shallow, right? So that the way the people looking at that data, it then gets subject to uh, much greater scrutiny and becomes much cleaner. Um, some of the other work that we did in agriculture was, for instance, looking at price data. So that the Ministry of Agriculture publishes price data, you know, on a weekly basis, and they send send that out to to consumers who are interested, they send it out to um, retail shops. And they've been doing that for a long time, but nobody was ever looking at the trend of this data. And so we took that data, um, helped them to make that open data, and had some students build some um, visualization apps, which show very clearly, for instance, here, the pricing, the cyclic pricing that takes place in many of our produce. And, you know, this pricing reflects, for instance, the perennial cycles of scarcity and glut that takes place in many of our agricultural produce. And it is symptomatic of a deeper problem of the lack of central planning, so that, you know, prices on tomatoes are high, so everybody goes and plants tomatoes, and three months later, the tomatoes come to market, and there's a glut. And so we have these perennial cycles. 
And open data can help to address those kinds of information asymmetry problems that affect how efficient um, agricultural production is in, in economies like ours. Um, one of the other examples that we need some work with is uh, with the government uh, in terms of publishing the budget. Um, so previously, the government was publishing the, the, the fiscal budget, um, but it was being published as PDF documents. Um, so that at any point in time, you could go to the government Minister of Finance's website and you could see, you could download about 83 different PDF documents, and that was the budget. Now, that's obviously not open data. Um, and as far as you could do with that, especially if you don't understand the budget. And so we took that data, uh, we worked with the Minister of Finance, and we were able to visualize it using a platform called Open Spending, and this becomes a budget. And the first time we published this, it was so impactful because people said, well, what's that big red uh, box? That's the size of our fiscal debt. And it's a problem that we speak about repeatedly. Uh, the challenges that Jamaica has with the size of its debt, which crowds out, uh, you know, the allocation of resources to other government services. Um, and in visual terms, just looking at that, it's very impactful uh, when you take a visualization of that fiscal budget. Um, so again, that was some of the work that we did. Um, the, the third example I mentioned is open data in tourism. Um, we did some interesting work and some interesting pilot projects around open data and interactive community mapping. And uh, I'm, I'm sure Belize, like Jamaican, uh, other Caribbean countries, um, tourism is a is, is a critical um, sector. And uh, increasingly, the tourism market is looking to alternative forms of tourism, such as heritage tourism, cultural, uh, nature-based tourism, not just sun, sand, and sea, which are kind of the traditional products. And so one of the things that is quite interesting is to work with communities that have some kind of distinctive um, character. It has to do with cultural or historical artifacts. And uh, what we did with um, these pilots is um, get some kids from these communities, uh, train them to do um, mapping, um, interactive um, mapping using mobile devices, and then publishing that data on a platform such as uh, OpenStreetMaps and then creating apps around that. So that becomes a kind of value-added um, opportunity. And so if you think about it, what that does is not only enhance the tourism product, um, but it also creates a sense of ownership by the community for their own product and what they have to offer, and the visibility that they cre can create through some of these uh, online platforms and value-added applications such as mobile tour guide apps. Um, so that, that's one of the interesting opportunities in tourism that we're continuing to do some work on. So I, I think uh, those, those give you uh, some examples of uh, some of the opportunities that we see, uh, certainly in Jamaica and in other countries in the Caribbean for using open data. Um, I won't spend much time on this chart. I mean, we've done some work with the World Bank doing open data readiness assessment studies in a number of countries to assess the opportunities. And one of the things that comes up repeatedly is the fact that there's a strong demand for uh, government open data by civil society, by innovators, by entrepreneurs, by academia. And, um, and the demand side is very strong. Uh, I mentioned that one of our pillars has to do with um, research and like I'm just checking on my time. Uh, okay, we're, we're doing fine, yes. Uh, yeah, one of the areas is uh, that's quite important uh, for us as a Caribbean Open Institute, again, because uh, a number of our founding partners are in fact university-based, is, is, is research. And uh, we've done a number of research studies in sectors that we consider critical to the Caribbean. Um, again, I've mentioned agriculture, tourism, education, national statistics, fisheries and marine protected areas, and uh, quite extensive uh, research reports around these studies that I'm, I'm happy to share um, uh, after this presentation. Um, and I can just summarize some of the work that we've done there, but I, I, 
And then I've given you the examples, a couple of examples that illustrate the potential impact in these sectors. So I won't spend too much time on that. Um, I want to turn to an important uh, point that uh, Daniel made again, and I can't emphasize it enough. Um, that, you know, open data thrives on building a vibrant ecosystem. It's not simply a matter, I mean, even though this, this graphic represents government sitting at the top of the food chain, the open data food chain, it's not simply a matter of governments publishing data and saying, okay, I've done my job. Um, Open data works if all of these actors, all of these stakeholders, um, whether it's civil society, NGOs, academia, um, the media, um, intermediaries, uh, the tech uh, activists, uh, uh, such as Daniel's organization that can take this data and translate it to value for um, consumers. Uh, the business community is an important um, actor, and I would suggest that for the Caribbean, getting the private sector actively involved in the open data ecosystem is critical to its sustainability. And of course, the citizens who uh, ultimately are the principal beneficiaries of the improved uh, access to information, improved services delivery that arises as a result of uh, uh, publishing open data. So it's an important point to be made that, you know, our governments have a critical role in enabling uh, this ecosystem, but by themselves, it, it doesn't work. It, it, it is only a valuable ecosystem if you can get all of these players to participate. And so I will spend a few minutes talking a little bit about another project that we've had in the Caribbean, which I think is perhaps one of the most significant because it really is a project around engaging all of these stakeholders to participate in the open data ecosystem. Um, and so it's an annual event. Well, it's not annual. We have it um, just now every other year. Um, it's called DEVCA, Developing the Caribbean. Uh, Daniel, I don't know if you're still online, but this uh, was actually modeled off uh, a Latin American um, initiative called DEVLA. Um, and so we worked very closely in the early years of DEVCA to pattern this of that. And it, it really is a multi-country open data conference and hackathon that takes place on an annual basis. And we've had thus far four editions and participating countries include Jamaica, Trinidad, the Dominican Republic, and Barbados, Guyana, Cuba, and St. Kitts. And uh, you know, as uh, Belize begins to contemplate um, you know, open data as an initiative, we'd love to see uh, Belize participating in the next edition of um, DEVCA. But it, it has been an incredibly important um, forum uh, for the Caribbean because it engages multiple stakeholders around thinking about what are the innovation opportunities for open data. And so by virtue of this event, we've had what I would say as the positive outcomes, just greater awareness, um, because we have a conference. Uh, we typically bring in um, international speakers to talk about offer open data perspective from other jurisdictions, but also the engagement with uh, uh, the civic tech community, with academia, with the media. It provides an opportunity to do experimentation and as a result of DEFCA, a number of entrepreneurial opportunities have emerged. So this has been a quite powerful platform for us. And as I said, it's, it's not just about engaging with Caribbean leaders, um, but it's also bringing international experts in to talk about um, you know, open data from other jurisdictions so that we're not sitting here trying to reinvent our own wheel, but to benefit from other perspectives. Um, it brings academia into the conversation and very importantly it brings the civic tech community into the conversation and this here is just a snapshot of one edition of DEVCA where over a 48 hour period we have developers in, in Jamaica, in Guyana, in the Dominican Republic, in Cuba, in Trinidad all participating on you know a set of problem scenarios that we challenge them to look at and we provide open data that facilitates it. 
it's amazing to see what happens when you take a bunch of creative people, put them in a room, um, facilitated, facilitated, of course, by domain experts. So in the last edition of DECA, we did some work on looking at approaches to the Zika virus, and that was facilitated by the Ministry of Health. And again, just to reiterate the point that Daniel made, when you bring the domain experts together with the um, tech activists, uh, a lot of interesting things happen from that kind of um, co-creation um, environment. And, and in the last edition, we started to engage with the business community around you know, what open data means for them, what the opportunities are, and again, that's a very important part of the dialogue. So as I mentioned, this was our last edition of, of DEVCA. In Jamaica, we were focused on the Zika virus um, and worked very closely with the Ministry of Health. And uh, a lot of really powerful ideas came from that uh, kind of engagement. Um, so again, just to emphasize the point that this is not just about suing about governments publishing um, data and saying I've done my job. Uh, you know, it's about building an ecosystem that is um, collaborative and, and vibrant and by working together can, can create value. So on, on this we work, for instance, with um, institutional partners such as PAHO, the Ministry of Health in Jamaica, uh, CARFA, which is the Caribbean um, Health Authority, and then um, again the developers um, across the multiple countries that were looking at a specific set of problems that were um, framed. Um, so, let me just uh, make this point. I mean, you know, as I said, for the Caribbean Open Institute, a large part of our focus has been around understanding the value opportunities for the Caribbean, um, doing actual research to test those hypotheses. And uh, you know, there are a lot of insights that have emerged from that, I would say, um, one, that innovation fellowships are absolutely critical. Um, again, these collaborative engagements between the government and civil society to create value in key sectors um, that are identified as priorities is, is absolutely an imperative. I think it's also important to say that government's role goes well beyond just supplying open data. Um, again, as you've seen from Daniel's um, presentation and also from the examples we've looked at, a big part of the value opportunities in terms of the beneficiaries of open data being published is in fact the government in terms of increased efficiencies in service delivery. And so that government has to play actively both on the supply and the demand side of the open data ecosystem, certainly for the Caribbean. Um, the other thing that I think is, is, is critical for us is that we have to look for opportunities to scale uh, the use of open data resources across the region. I, I don't think, and thus far, you know, aside from some of the work we've done, thus far a lot of the initiatives have been country-level initiatives. I think that is absolutely important for us to look at regional approaches so that we build a kind of Caribbean digital commons um, that can give us a common set of platforms and tools and standards and in fact apps that we can share across the region. Because wherever I talk about the problem of pretty large and that's not just a Jamaica problem, it's the same problem in Guyana, I imagine in Belize, in Trinidad, and so we have to take the opportunity to find common approaches and to share those approaches. And the final point is that if open data is going to be sustainable, then we have to find a way to make sure that that open data ecosystem becomes a vibrant one. Um, just a few of the key challenges, I, I would say, and um, I say it without apology, that I think a lot of uh, country leadership has been a little bit apathetic uh, towards open data, um, even in the face of evidence that it can create enormous value. And uh, I think, um, I mean, understandably, you know, in, in many jurisdictions there are other pressing priorities, um, but I think with opportunities for co-creation, working with civil society, we, we, have to, we have to take the opportunities that Open Data presents. Um, scalability has always been a perennial challenge for the Caribbean, and I, I think uh, 
you know, for the between 18 and 20 countries in the Caribbean region, many of them small countries of uh, tens of thousands of citizens. We have to take regional approaches if we're going to scale open data. Uh, capacity building, basic digital literacy across the board is fundamentally important. And as I said, um, we need to find uh, the network effects from greater regional collaboration. Uh, you know, I, I like this. Uh, I, I like this quote from um, Nigel Shadbolt of the Open Data Institute. Open data is one of the few resources that is defined by abundance rather than scarcity. Uh, you know, this is something that we have. It is an existing resource. It is one that increases every day, just by virtue of what we do as governments, and it's the closest thing that we can get to generating economic winners and not having the risk of too much losers. So, you know, the opportunity that open data presents is, is both an economic and a social opportunity as well as a political opportunity. And finally, um, you know, one of the things that we've tasked ourselves to do is to think about the Caribbean of the future, uh, you know, and the digital Caribbean, because digital is the way of the world, and if we're if we're going to continue to compete as a region, we have to embrace digital approaches to our commercial, social, business um, interactions. Um, I think open data is an important part of that. Um, I, I think if we if we envisage a future digital Caribbean, at least a few of the pillars of that has to do with have to be around regional open data portals, um, finding a way to address data literacy problems across the board in a very comprehensive way. Um, and this is from primary and secondary education all the way up to the public sector in the private sector. Um, to continue to work with platforms and forums such as DEVCA to make sure that we have spaces where multiple stakeholders can come together to um, find innovative solutions to problems. And this idea of the Caribbean apps ecosystem is one that I'm very interested in. Uh, again, the two apps that Daniel mentioned are apps that are very adaptable and reusable in the Caribbean. So we have to find a way to stop uh, reinventing the wheel, but also to take apps that can provide value and make them applicable to our own indigenous circumstances. Um, so those are my remarks. I'm hoping they're useful, and uh, Mike, I'm happy to take any questions and to participate in the discussions that follow. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Maurice, for this presentation. I mean, it is so great that we can have a really perspective um, in this session and within the sessions. Uh, it is great. Uh, thank you. Um, it brings me to uh, my, my to a lot of different points, um, but it's good to hear uh, that things are happening in the Caribbean, uh, and it's also good to hear that there are opportunities to continue advancing open data in the Caribbean. Uh, the role of the university, definitely critical on this. Um, the, war, the, 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 um, the work and engagement of all actors, as uh, Daniel mentioned, a uh, multi-stakeholder approach as you reiterated that, a multi-stakeholder approach where an ecosystem uh, that's strong, it's important, not only at the national level, but also at the regional level. And so that is absolutely um, important and great. Thank you for all the insights. I will ask um, Daniel if he can join us with uh, your camera. We're going to switch to our Q&A. And um, there have already been, there are already some questions there. I'm going to let um, Henry, uh, way to moderate that. Um, so uh, please be attentive uh, to that. We have um, still 30 minutes to focus on that exchange. Let's see how that takes us. Uh, and, and let's use the, this time as, as best as possible. And uh, so remember all participants to leave your questions, raise your questions. I know Henry must have some. I do have some. Um, and I'm just going to leave one and I let um, Henry to, to moderate that after all is and, and it's a specific a specific question for for Daniel uh, in terms of 
you could tell us a little bit about how was that relationship between between you as a civil society organization that uh, you we and um, the actual government offices who were supportive of these two projects a tu servicio and por mi barrio and it's just tell us I'm, I'm interested in, in, in hearing from you how that evolved you know what was in the beginning what was throughout the implementation and what is it now uh, thank you i leave it there so henry i let you uh, moderate the rest of the of the session thank you very much and thank you again to all the participants Hi, good morning guys Thank you, Mike. Uh, good morning, Daniel. Good morning, Maurice. Thank you, guys. Um, connecting from Belize. Uh, just wanted to echo Mike's uh, quick uh, uh, thanks to our participants and to our panelists, presenters here. Um, we're starting the Q&A session. As Mike noted, uh, we have 30 minutes to go. We don't want to keep you guys back. Uh, but that, that's a very, very interesting question, Mike. And uh, you picked my brain because um, I have a couple questions uh, for Daniel on that uh, in terms of the relationship with um, uh, civil society partners and, and the government. So uh, I guess, Daniel, if you'd, if you'd like to go ahead and jump on Mike's question. Yeah. Sure. Um, well, basically, what, what we have are agreements with them. But I must say that also a very important part of how we work is being very informal and trying to keep uh, close relationships with key people in government. Um, I mean, when, once we find somebody that we know wants to uh, get involved and transform or whatever <laughs> some practices within government, those are the people we try to keep great relations with. And um, usually those are the ones that recommend the kind of work that we do to other people in other parts of government. And that's how we end up with a network of, if you want, advocates or whatever of open government and open data. Um, and that's actually Mike asked how this ended up transforming in time. For instance, with with Pomi Barrio, we had this previous relationship with some key people in the local government, who are the ones that actually promoted open data and actually made a lot of great work way before we started um, collaborating with them. But still, it was a sort of um, us going to them, asking for them to approve our project. We worked um, through an agreement, which both parties signed. And um, and the, the, the projects themselves were sovereign, in the sense that we could do our thing, and they could do their thing. And we, had, we didn't have to completely agree on everything. But that has changed within time. Actually, Atos Arvizio was the one that ended up being a very strong co-creation collaboration thing. It was also through an agreement. I mean, like the, the legal stuff was exactly the same, but the way we worked was completely different um, because the project was owned by both parties at the same time. And since that was a, a very successful project, it, it was the one that made the whole dynamic change completely. We went from, um, from, from demanding uh, partnerships with government to actually having an offer of partnerships. People started calling us to get new projects going around government. Um, yeah, I think that that's basically the, the idea. Well, thank you. Uh, what were some of the challenges, maybe just to, to dive a little bit deeper into that, what were some of the challenges that you guys experienced? Uh, because in, in the Belize context, open data is such a new concept, open government, a uh, very new concept for us here. Um, we're learning a lot, and I'm, I'm sure that participants uh, would agree. What were some of the initial challenges that you guys experienced, and uh, how did you uh, tackle those those obstacles? Um, well, actually, I, I can link that to one of the questions that Brandon asked earlier. Like, for instance, data validity. Um, that's one. I, I wouldn't actually call it a challenge. I think also Maurice was very clear on that. I would call it a fear <laughs> more than a challenge. Um, there, there is always this fear of uh, what if what the data I have is not perfect, and then I can get somebody complaining or even you know suing me or whatever. Um, I I think that the the way to think about that is 
the data you have is the data you're currently using to take decisions and work every single day. So if that's wrong, then you already have the problem. The, the, the fact that you make it visible to the outside, again, as Maurice already said, only can make it better because you can improve on what you have. If you don't make it transparent, if you don't want to actually admit that you might have bad quality data, then you will never improve it, <laughs> ever. But you will still be using it to take decisions. So um, this transparency is actually a very, very, very good tool to improve data quality and to actually solve those problems of data quality that you might be having and you don't know if you have or you don't. Um, on the fact that or on who uh, validates, I think that was the, um, uh, yes, validates the data on the question. Um, uh, that's m the most important part of the answer is, for instance, on the health project on Ato Servicio, that was the information that the government already was working on. So that's what make it, makes it valid. Um, I mean, we can go to the particulars. Some of the data was recollect collected directly by the government. Some other data was uh, through sworn declarations by providers. But anyway, the most important thing is that is the, the, the information the ministry used on a daily basis. Um, for a project like Por Mi Barrio, where you have the citizens uploading information, if you want, through claims, that's a bit different question, but I think the answer is very similar. Um, the, the fact that if you can trust or not the information you receive, that goes through the steps you can take to, valid, like to validate the people that, that the claims you receive are actually by people. For instance, in the local government's case, they demand you use your ID number when you make a claim. Of course, you can use somebody else's or you can fake it if you have the skills. Um, but that's one step further in having some kind of control. But I always try to clarify whenever this comes up that everyone has a huge fear with fake reports. And in our experience, that is not the case. In the case of Por Mi Barrio, at least, we've been doing this for four years. And we had zero fake claims. I mean, we had some people that used the platform to complain about something, and it's not an actual uh, claim. You just delete that. That's easily detected. But somebody saying, this has happened, and that being a lie, that has happened, uh, never happened ever. So these kind of fears are usually um, oversized. <laughs> Excellent. Is there? Uh, I, I see, um, Maurice, that you're you're uh, to jump in. Is there any uh, anything you'd like to share or add to that? Yeah, I was just going to make the point. Um, and the issue of the quality of data and the the use of that either as a fear or an excuse of publishing data is is quite pervasive. I mean, we've encountered it across all of the agencies, many of the agencies that we've worked with. Um, a case in point is, you know, working in agriculture. Um, so the agency that's responsible for extension services to farmers, they go out and they collect data from farmers, right, because it's used for, to understand production and to do statistical projections and so forth. And in real way, you know, there are 120 extension officers in Jamaica and close to 200,000 farmers. So they will never be able to get to every farmer. So they have to statistically decide where we're going to pick so much and then they do projections. And so we said, well, why not have the farmers self-report their production activity? Which is an interesting issue. It's a very simple technical um, activity, in fact. I mean, every farmer has a mobile phone. It's very easy for them with a simple app to report their production activity. And theoretically, you could solve that problem of data collection quite easily. You could be getting data from every farmer almost on a you know, weekly or daily or whatever basis is required. But the challenge is trust. The government agency doesn't believe that farmers will report accurately. So we're currently exploring that because we think it's such a big opportunity to address the gaps in that data collection uh, pipeline. And, and we believe there are opportunities to build in back-end validation processes and, in fact, even some social mechanisms to keep 
farmers honest, right? I mean, we're conscious in the world where people read their own meters and report it. Uh, that, that doesn't happen in the Caribbean. Um, but those are some of the issues that we think there are technical solutions to, but we have to find ways to address the, the social barriers um, that uh, constrain those kinds of uh, solutions. Uh, the other point I would make on challenges, um, similar to Daniel, we've had the opportunity to work with a number of agencies, and as long as these are funded initiatives, we've been able to sign MA MOUs and to get pilot projects going. But as soon as you get to the stage, you now have to look to government procurement processes to fund these kinds of engagements. It doesn't happen because government procurement processes are designed not in a way that is amenable to these kind of innovation um, co-creation fellowships. Uh, they're designed around going out to tender and having very detailed um, RFPs and having bidders from international international community. And so they're not amenable to these kinds of solutions. And so we, we found that the existing procurement processes are one of the biggest barriers to us taking these very productive pilots that we've done and moving them to to, to, to production. Excellent. Thank you, Doctor. I'm seeing a question here from uh, Mr. Brandon Young. Uh, he works at the Central uh, Information Technology Office here in Belize. Uh, and he's asking, uh, by his estimation, it might be a, a tricky question, but uh, he's going for it. Uh, doctor, how long would you estimate the idea of open sharing across the region would actually formalize? About yeah, OK. Yes. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting conversation that we're currently having with a number of groups across the region about this idea of what we call a Caribbean data consensus, which uh, looks at common approaches, adopts common approaches to how we deal with the whole data ecosystem. I mean, not just open data, but big data, for instance, and some of the challenges around statistical reporting. Um, what is very clear to me is that the traditional institutional approaches around the way entities like CARICOM works um, are probably not going to be the right approaches um, because their decision-making cycles are, are far too long. Um, I would say, for instance, that uh, the work that we did with the DEVCA conference allowed us to mobilize very quickly teams of developers and uh, government stakeholders in multiple countries working on themed problems and collaborating. And it's very organic. Um, and I think what we're looking for is something that's much closer to that kind of organic approach than something that is the more traditional, formal, institutional approach. Um, but that, that's just my perspective. Um, having said that, I, I think that there is definitely a need for a kind of at least form a statement of intent. And uh, we're currently working with a couple of groups now to try and mobilize what we call a Caribbean data consensus. So we'll see, we'll see how that works out. I'm sorry, it was a kind of a rambling answer and, <laughs> and probably give it a little bit more thought. But uh, yeah, I think we have to find the right balance between organic approaches that take advantage of uh, the the constituents that exist across the ecosystem, between that and the very formal um, institutionalized approaches that have characterized many of our regional efforts, many of which have not been as successful as they should be. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to, oh, OK. We have another question from uh, Inaldi Gomez from the Immigration uh, Department. Uh, he's asking a question for both. In your experience, have you used surveys to gather data sets, or has it always been data gathered by uh, already existing services within government? Belize is a young nation and small, uh, so some of the services we offer are still manual, and hence data sets are not readily available in electronic format. Furthermore, if we would gather their data in Excel format at the very least, it, not, it may not be normalized, and data duplicity might be high. So I'm just thinking for these departments, what would be a better approach prior to their data being gathered in? 
So uh, I guess. The um, I can take that if that's all right with you, Moise. Sure. Uh, sorry, Dan. Um, I, I can I can answer that. Uh, actually, when I think of open data projects, I'm not limiting myself to using open data, but uh, also generating open data. Uh, to be honest, Por Mi Barrio has a huge component of open data generation, I think even more than, than usage or consumption, um, because it produces much more data than the one that it consumes. And something very similar, uh, you could say, of any of the access to information platforms that are out there, like uh, Alabatelli, that we have also an installation called Quesabes, um, where the platform is used as a tool for something, in this case, uh, to make access to information requests. But then from the usage of that platform, you can get open data uh, that can inform you about, for instance, what what sort of issues people are, are interested in. As a quick example, our data from that open, uh, sorry, access to information platform was used by uh, the Office of Planning uh, and and budgeting to design an uh, open data portal because they they used the data on what kind of access to information requests were made since 2012 to I think 2016 or something like that to see what sort of information they should have published they should publish sorry in their own open data portal so yes I don't know surveys or any other method I think would be fine. Uh, you can design um, a whole project just to gather the information, not necessarily to use it. Yeah, um, I'll just just to add to what Daniel said. I, I think uh, you know it's, it's the kind of problem that uh, I think it's important to approach uh, around a specific situation as against looking at a government-wide approach to addressing the data collection challenge or addressing um, shortage of data. Again, for instance, just to use an illustration, um, so the work that we did in the community tourism pilot, we trained kids in the community to go out and map their community. And over the course of a four to six week project, we had communities that were completely mapped. Now, this is data that traditionally the Social Development Commission was sending out their own um, agents to map community artifacts and assets for purposes of, you know, um, social projects and disaster preparedness and so forth. Getting citizens involved, getting the community involved, um, using crowdsourcing, I think is a very powerful way to address some of the gaps that exist in government data. Um, and the same thing that happened with uh, working with um, uh, farmers in agriculture, for instance. Um, the opportunity for crowdsourcing using very simple technologies and very basic devices that everybody has, I think is something that is a quite powerful opportunity. I think we just have to be more creative about um, exploiting those mechanisms for data collection. And, you know, I, I know so, the, like our national statistical office, they sort of, was, you know, have uh, systematic ways of ensuring that the statistical quality of data is above board. So there is, you know, the way they do censuses or samples, and so sometimes there's a temptation to uh, avoid imperfect solutions because we're looking for data that's close to perfect. Um, I, I think some of these crowdsourcing opportunities are things that we have to um, explore and experiment with um, and accept that data can be imperfect but still have a lot of utility. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you, guys. Uh, I have a question for uh, Daniel. Um, uh, seeing that you're based in Uruguay and, and we've heard from other participants uh, in Latin America uh, in terms of some of the how how open data got developed within their country, so could you give us a little bit of background on the development of open data and open government uh, there in Uruguay in terms of, of some of the initial 
a movement forward who are some of the initial champions and of course I, we would believe that there are existing legislation that speaks to freedom of information uh, so do you, could, could you speak uh, to the group on that yeah sure um, the basically the, the first people to get involved with open data uh, were part of the local government in Montevideo uh, they worked there but they were also very involved with the free software uh, movement and stuff like that and they started pushing for open data internally which was actually quite a feat and uh, I always try to recognize them for that because um, by the time that we had a civil society um, trying to work with open data they already had not only a portal with some information published but they also had um, internal normative for the local government that stated that all information they had was uh, possible as um, for, for publication as open data so in that sense they were like way ahead of the curve um, that then translated into a um, multi-stakeholder group led by the e-government agency the, the, like the open data working group that's the official nomenclature um, which involved uh, the academy uh, different parts of government already working with that um, and civil society we basically designed the open data strategy for the country based on having a central portal having that portal based on CCAN which is also free software and we believe the, the standard for uh, open data portals um, and designing what that portal should have how it should handle the different actors and if we had to federate or not the the production of and uploading of data <coughs> and all that was very early on around 2011 something like that and from then on basically uh, most of the work has been around convincing people to uh, get on board with that sort of thing there are uh, a few um, normative things that help us with that but it's relatively small we have access to information of course and one of the important things is that it has been ruled that since access to information gives uh, makes sorry all information public unless reserved with specific uh, reasons that means that basically all public information should be open data so in that sense it was uh, it's relatively easy to argue for open data within the state uh, beyond that you don't usually find too much of a resistance uh, once you, you you pass the barrier of making them understand that the information they have is public information uh, they are now uh, I mean like uh, all agencies in government are now uh, mandated by law to publish all the information that the access to information law defines as um, active transparency which is a, 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 a set of data sets sorry for the redundance there uh, that they should publish actively proactively they also should publish that as open data so that's where we are now we are trying to enforce that um, so if, if that actually comes to fruition we should have a ton of data sets published which is not the case yet but that's what we are working on case of, of uh, Jamaica uh, doctor could you highlight and share what the yes. uh, experience has been in the development of open government and open data uh, on the island sure uh, specific to open data um, in truth the trajectory has been a little bit different and it really started from a demand side perspective so a lot of the early open data work actually started with the work that um, we were doing with agencies such as the Ministry of Agriculture or, or, or rather the Extension Services Agency and also in tourism. So a, a lot of the early work was very much demand side driven. Uh, the first uh, open data portal or site around agriculture data was actually published by ourselves working with the Ministry of Agriculture. Um, so a lot of the early work was, was around that stimulus. Now, uh, Jamaica has had access to information legislation for some time. Um, 
Yeah, and so unless there was that sort of orientation to make uh, public sector data uh, available on demand. Um, over the years, um, working, for instance, with the World Bank and the Open Data Readiness Assessment, the government uh, then published an open data portal, uh, which was done in 2015 or 2016, I believe. Um, so it has been progressive. Um, and now there's work around the open data policy, which is still a draft bill. Um, but that's actually an important next step because absent an open data policy, there's nothing which compels government agencies to actually pub publish data. I mean, it is. Uh, policy is not so much law as it is a statement of intent, and uh, I think we're at the stage where having done the portal first, um, the portal was published with great fanfare, and then there was a year where it wasn't updated at all because there, there was no sort of overarching policy or sort of commitment at all levels to continue to publish data. So it, it has been progressive, uh, a little bit sketchy, um, but, but, but I would say there has been an active process of uh, demand side civil society actors such as academia and the Caribbean Open Institute perhaps taking the lead and working with um, the government to get to this stage today where we, we have an active portal, uh, we have a policy which is being promulgated and Jamaica is a signatory to the OGP partnership uh, I think uh, at the end of 2017 and we're in the process of thinking through what a set of commitments look like. So uh, if you look at the trajectory, it has taken place over perhaps not an ideal time frame, but it is progressing in the right direction. Um, generally speaking, for the rest of the Caribbean, uh, when you look at the uh, open data barometer, uh, countries like Jamaica, uh, Dominican Republic, uh, Trinidad and Tobago, and St. Lucia, in fact, which just publish a portal and their own policy are tend to be the leading countries and there are engagements in a number of other countries but perhaps not to the same level of maturity. Wonderful. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Daniel. I see that we're approaching time, uh, gentlemen and uh, participants. Uh, so I'd want to hand it over at this point back to Mike. Closing. Thank you. Uh, um, thank you to the participants. Thank you to the speakers. I'm just going to uh, start closing. I want to thank uh, Mr. Carranza uh, in Uruguay uh, for your participation. Thank you uh, to you, to Data Ui. Thank you very much. Insightful um, cases that continue to be well known in the region. I'm glad that we got them uh, in, into the leagues. Um, I hope they will inspire uh, others as well. So thank you very much, uh, as well as Dr. McNaughton in Jamaica uh, for the Caribbean perspective to this. Let's hope how we can think um, more of this project with the core activities, specifically the regional ones. Um, and, and of course, uh, a word to all the participants to take advantage of resources out there for the Caribbean. Uh, developed and research through uh, COI. Uh, so thank you very much. I, I, I know uh, Maurice for quite a while. I met him in London at the margins of an OGP in 2013, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and since then, uh, you know, I, I have seen him pushing, um, breaking through um, open data in the Caribbean. Um, and so, so thank you very much as well for your insights. Thanks to all the participants. Um, as we said, um, this session has been recorded. We will share with you uh, together with their presentation. So uh, stay tuned. This is the web page as well of the project so we can uh, continue to be engaged. And, and, and as this week, we are approaching our last session of this training that we put together in Open Data uh, for Belize. Uh, we will from then start working on on the different activities that will be uh, need to be implemented before the end of the year in the list with this project. So uh, we'll be um, heavily uh, working with the Trust for the Americas on this, uh, setting up those activities, additional training, the projects, the, 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 in, in, in the different settings, um, 
that we're going to have in training and best practice exchange forum and a round table dialogue um, before the end of the year. So stay tuned on that. But uh, first, stay tuned on the next session, which is this Thursday at 10 a.m. Uh, just to confirm the time, 10 a.m. the least time. Uh, initially, it was scheduled for 9. There is a change, so make sure that you make that you take that note. Take note of that. Um, the, the session will begin as today at 10 a.m. the least time uh, on Thursday. Today, we learn about using open data at the light of the cases. At the light of the cases, on Thursday, after seeing these cases, we're going to learn about how that's done in. From a technical perspective, um, and that will be our very last uh, session. For that, we're going to have the co-founder and director of Social Tech, uh, who's also um, engaged um, leading uh, so the School of Data uh, in, in the Spanish version. Um, and, and we heard from uh, Camila last week, Camila Salazar from School of Data as well uh, on, on, on a session last week. So um, he's going to be, or Manuel Casanueva is going to be here to tell us all about it. Thank you, Henry, of course. Thank you to all the participants again. Um, and I will see you next week. I'll let you, um, uh, Maurice and, uh, and, and Daniel, to, to just uh, say goodbye, as well as, as Henry for the closing. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much everyone and any questions just let us know thank you gentlemen so much thank you Mike thank you Daniel uh, doctor uh, it, it has been a very informative session uh, I want to thank all the participants who joined us today and just again to echo that reminder guys uh, Thursday uh, 10 a.m. Uh, we're going to be sending out all the uh, resources uh, after the close of today's session and uh, we look forward to seeing you guys join us uh, this Thursday at 10 a.m. Again, thanks to everyone. Mike, Daniel, Maurice, thank you. Uh, have a great day ahead, guys. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. You too. Bye-bye.